Welcome to what I hope is the next to the last or the penultimate part of this series. This engine really has taken some mending, because it was never built to run in the first place, it was built solely as a display item, so it's been a bit of a challenge making it go. Here I'm marking out the second half of the drop arm that moves the valve gear. I know it's very crude and it's very non-mechanical and it's certainly not good engineering, but it works. I'm just scribing lines on a piece of metal. I didn't bother using any engineer's blue because I could see the line okay. You probably can't see it too well on the video. But I drilled two holes and reamed them. One of the holes is 5 sixteenths of an inch in diameter and the other one is a quarter inch in diameter. And the quarter inch hole is designed to take the existing fitting that connects to the arms that operate the expansion link. In this clip, and again it's freehand, I'm just marking out where I need to put the piece in the milling machine to cut it to the right shape. It needs to be tapered towards the quarter inch end, as you can see here. This, however, is not the finished part. I will be doing much work on the linisher, rounding one end and making both sides even and removing the tool marks in general. In this clip I'm doing a very loose fit of the parts to check that the original spacer, which was made from brass, is the right thickness. So now it's over to the lathe to make a special part. On the original fitting, all that was down the centre was a 3 piece of steel bar. And that's no good at all, because a couple of grub screws are just not going to hold this in place properly. What I propose to do is to make a special fitting with both ends machined to 5 sixteenths of an inch in diameter, and then I'm going to lock tight the parts together and finally pin them so they're never going to work loose. You may have noticed that the video was running very fast. I've slowed it down for this bit. I'm parting off the work and then I reverse it in the chuck to machine the other end. So I end up with a spacer and two 5 sixteenths of an inch diameter stubs on each end. And the final part of the operation is to use a centre drill followed by a drill that is one imperial size below 3 sixteenths of an inch and then run a 3 16 of an inch reamer through the whole thing, which will then allow the original 3 16 of an inch shaft to be loctited into the hole. Time now for the big clean up using 400 grade wet to dry sandpaper. I'm not doing the full thing here, I'm just showing you how I do it. This is quite laborious and takes quite a long time, but the more work you put into the parts, the better they look. I don't want to go too mad on this engine because the other parts of the engine are not brilliant. So once the freshly cleaned up parts are degreased, it's time to use some Loctite 638 to cement everything together. I could of course silver solder these parts together quite easily, but then all the metalwork would need cleaning up yet again. So I'm using Loctite 638 because it's more than strong enough for the application, particularly when the parts are also going to be pinned together. I will do that once I've tested that everything works. This Loctite 638 is thicker than 601 or 603 and it seems to grab slightly quicker, so you have to work fast. I'm rotating the part to make sure I get an even coating of Loctite on every part of the surface so there are no dry spots. After leaving the part for a while to allow the Loctite to set on the first part of the component, I'm now adding the second piece. Again, plenty of Loctite and much rotation to spread the Loctite because we don't want any dry spots. And I now add the second component, and here you can clearly see a bit more rotation going on. Once the Loctite is totally spread on both components, it's time to put them on the bench, but because these components are tapered, I had to use a suitable packing, and my little Allen key was just the right size. Then I left the piece on the bench till the Loctite had cured, and using some more Loctite, I fastened the 3 sixteenths pin into the hole. And again, this is going nowhere. And once I drill for the pins, it's all going to be firmly pinned together. This will be a very strong part once it's finished. But under no circumstances, just leave it held together with Loctite. It may work, but you'll probably find it will move. It's vital to pin these parts together once the Loctite is fully cured. For those who've been watching the previous episodes, I did say I was going to put the screws to the back, but I actually prefer them to the front. So now it's time to put the valve gear together. The first thing to put in is the actuating rod. This is a threaded rod that goes into the die block that moves this part back and forth, which in turn moves the expansion link back and forth, which then causes the valve events to be controlled by either eccentric. This threaded cross shaft is not actually threaded all the way down. There is a parallel part that goes through the gunmetal plumber blocks, and there's a nut that tightens up against this, 
So when you rotate the little wheel, it's just the actuating arm that goes back and forth. In one of the previous videos, I showed how the actual eccentric rod had broken. It had come away from the eccentric. I think it's supposed to be soldered into the eccentric, but this one wasn't. The other one seems very strong, so I think that is a good solder joint. But this one was just a mess. So I'm having to remove the eccentric and remove the rod to fix it. And if you take a close look at this clip currently playing, you'll see how I fixed it. First of all, I cleaned up the parts, then loctited the eccentric rod into the fork on the eccentric strap. Then I drilled two holes all the way through the assembly, which I threaded 5BA, put a couple of 5BA brass bolts in there with some loctite again, and then ground off the whole lot. This makes for a very strong and permanent repair. The rest of the assembly is plain sailing, very simple. These are the two arms that in turn connect to the drop arm, which moves the expansion link back and forth. I do keep coming across things on this engine that I don't like, many of them as well. This is not too bad. The arms to the expansion link are held to these brass collars, but with a bolt, which is not really good, it should be a stud, because it's not a good bearing surface, isn't the edge of a thread on a bolt. I may actually alter this before I finish the engine. Now I have a fully functioning drop arm, I really want to get the engine to run and see how it actually runs properly. I don't mean with me holding things in place with my fingers either, which is quite dangerous and a very stupid thing to do. But these days it seems to be the most exciting thing that I get in my life, well, apart from bungee jumping over the crocodile infested river, and I don't do much of that either. So now it's time to turn the nice little hand wheel which sends the expansion link across the valve fork, and this seems to work very well. I'm not really surprised because the drop arm is to the correct dimensions to fit the engine. It's not to the drawing, but it fits the engine's dimensions. So now I can give the engine a test run, and guess what? It sounds like a pneumatic drill. There are two things wrong, one that I knew about and the other one that is a new one. The flywheel is slipping round on the crankshaft, and also the crank web, which I fixed in place, is not fixed in place securely enough because the valve events are very premature. The valve opens far too soon and it's giving real hammer blows and it's actually loosening the crank web. Both of these problems are easily rectified. I'll show this in the next and final episode. Originally the valve was too big for the ports, so the timing was very retarded. So I removed some metal from the edge of the valve and I think maybe I've taken a fraction too much off there. So in the next episode I'll be showing how I put this right. It's going to be quite interesting and it's something you may not have seen before. The old phrase you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear is very true with this engine. I will however get it to run much better than this. And here you can see the crank web making its own erratic movements where it wants to do which is definitely not good for valve events as well. All will be revealed in the next episode. For now, thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.